singing Have Faith I was reminded of our scripture that we read uh, this morning from Isaiah 53 uh, verses 1 through 5 uh, with the emphasis on verse 5 but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, of, of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now, I want everybody to say that last part with me. And with his stripes, we are healed. My topic this morning, with his stripes. Um, I've been doing some studying here lately and which has prompted some things to be heavy in my thoughts, um, thus our sermon last week. And so you are getting stuff that I'm getting and I just can't help it. But I'm one of these people, if I get it, I want to pass it on because I want folks to know what I'm learning. I want folks to know what I'm getting. So, same thing's gonna happen today. I just can't help it. When I get excited about stuff I get, I wanna share it. It's just like when uh, folks that were teasing me about uh, some of what I cook, all right? Um, I got this thing when I'm cooking something and some of y'all, <laughs> you're smiling. No comment, No comment, yeah. And I know some of the stuff I cook you might not like because I know I've got some folks that don't like, don't like Brussels sprouts and some folks that don't like asparagus and some folks, some things that I have, I, I heard you, ew. Well, I like them. Y'all like oatmeal, ew. I don't like that. Well, I cooked a couple of things the last couple of weeks and of course when I cook something, then I take a picture of it and I post it on Facebook, all right? And 
so when I when I do something that I think I like or I learn something, I like to share it. So just like I show pictures of stuff I cook, I share what I learn because if I got something good, I want to share it. So I can't help but share some of the stuff I'm learning because as I grow in Christ, I want folks to grow with me. I heard this story one time, you know, uh, Christians are just people who are beggars that learn where food is and they share with other beggars where to find good food. And so, this message with his stripes has to do with the second part. We are healed. So I want to look at the three types of healing that we receive if we open ourselves to them in Christ Jesus. And I want to look at what this passage has to say to us because I believe that there's a lot of times we won't tap into the things of God for various reasons. And we've read this passage many times in the Old Testament. Many of us know that this prophetic word was fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus. This passage excites me because when Isaiah wrote it, it was almost a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And when I learned that, I really got excited because it made the word of God that much more valid in my life. It made the things of God that much more concrete in my life. It made the things that God has done in my life more reinforced and I can't help it. <laughs> so I'd like to look at what this passage has to say to us. And I pray that this passage will cause believers to tap more into the things that God wants to do in each of us. I believe that when we pray, it's not just words bouncing off a ceiling. It's not just words we say in idle rhetoric. But as I've said to you over and over and over again, when we pray, we are talking to God. A God who listens and a God who answers and a God who gives results when we pray. So, I want to look at asking you a question. What do you need in your life when you pray? And are you willing to receive it when you ask for it? Now, we don't always tap into all that Christ has for us. Now, I think about a lot of scriptures that we read about the different miracles and all that were done, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And, and I know a lot of times people read that, and particularly atheists think, oh, Oh, there, those are nice fairy stories. <coughs> nah. Those things, if you're a believer, they really happen. Now, 
in our church doctrine, we believe that the Bible is the pure and unadulterated word of God. That's what the Baptist church doctrine teaches. And I believe if you look in the front of your hymn book, you'll find that when you read down, there's some, some articles of faith in there. And one of them, if you look down, it says what the scriptures are. And it says that we believe that the scriptures are the inerrant word of God, infallible, infallible word of God, and it is, and see somebody didn't pulled a hymn book out already. That's right, check to make sure I'm telling you right. It is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction. Look and see if it's in there. It has God as its author, salvation as its end, and truth without error. Am I right? So therefore, God is not a liar. So therefore, the words that are in there, Old Testament and New Testament, are the word of God. Everything that is in it God said it, he did it, it's true, that settles it, case closed. Did somebody find it? Did you see it? So therefore, the miracles in the Old Testament, they happen. Ooh, God, they Somebody's never read that before. That's what we believe. That's part of what we believe. Those are the tenets of faith. Those are the statements of faith that we believe as Christians in the Baptist, in the Baptist faith. Uh-huh. See? I'm right. I'm right. How do I know it? I had to learn this before I was ordained. 40 some years ago and it stuck with me. When I really came to know Jesus, it sank in, this is true. So therefore, everything that's in there is without error. To sum it up, it is the Bible, this book, is the inerrant word of God, written by men, divinely inspired of God. It is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction. I'm getting chills now just talking about it. A perfect treasure of heavenly instruction. Now, we don't always tap into all that Christ has for us for a couple of reasons. And a couple of reasons are, is maybe because we don't spend time with him in fellowship. And, 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 and a lot of that has to do with, it takes time for us to grow to that level, all right? Because we're so used to tangible things. We're used to spending time with folks we can see, touch, smell if you got on cologne. All right? And back away from if they got on too much. And you're allergic to it. Sister Barbara. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean. All right, you got the picture? But 
When we come to know Christ, we open ourselves up to the spiritual realm and we sense things in another realm other than the physical. We start to sense things in the spiritual realm. Now, I realize that sometimes before we come to know Christ, we can sense things around us. Because sometimes, ooh, I get a, I get a bad feeling. Mm -hmm. All right? You walk into a room, ooh, something don't feel right. Feelings are different than being in the spiritual realm. Feelings are based on e emotion. Feelings are based on things that happen. Now, we'll get into that a little bit because that goes into something else I want to talk about here. All right. Now, if y'all waiting for a hoop, holler and shout message, this won't be it today. This is more. We're going to do some teaching today because there's, uh, there's some things I, I really think we, we all need to get. Um, now, if I feel that you're falling asleep, I might go mm, to make sure you're awake. Okay. But, but hear me, hear me out here. Um, the reason we don't tap into a lot of things is, is because sometimes we haven't reached out and touched the Lord in the spiritual realm. We have not developed a, a relationship with him to fellowship with him as we would a close friend. And that's what God wants. That's number one, we need to do that. We have to spend time with him. The other thing is, we have to spend time in his word, okay? Um, we got to get to know each other. I was at a birthday party a couple of weeks ago of a friend and they ask some questions, and, I, and I, I know some of you all have been to those birthday parties where they pass out these little slips, you know, how well do you know your friend, you know, what's their favorite dish, what's their favorite ice cream, what do they not like, yeah, and, and if I were to pass out something like that, some of y'all would know, I can't stand airplanes, I don't like oatmeal, um, you know, those kind of things. You might know how many dogs I have, uh, things like that. Yeah, you, know, you might know some things about me. Um, I might know some things about you. Uh, you might not know my shoe size. You might not know my, my, my suit size. I might know, not know some of those things about there. You know, th those are things you might not know. But the way you get to know someone, you spend time with them. You read about them. It's just like when we do those black history moments. You know, some of those things that we learned, we either read about them, all right, or somebody talked to us about them, and then we followed up with the research. And the way we learn about the Lord is we spend time with him in, in the word, all right? We spend time fellowshipping with each other. We learn about more about the Lord from the testimonies of each other, what the Lord has done in each other's lives. That's why the scripture tells us that iron sharpens iron. So along with, along with communicating with God on my own and through my own prayer life, talking to the Lord on my own, in my own prayer life, you know, sometimes praying with someone else. We have a conversation with God together as we do in corporate prayer. That's when the church comes together. We pray together. One can put a 1,000 to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. That's praying together. All right? The other thing we do is uh, when we spend time with his word, we are learning about him. All right? So those are ways we learn about him. But when I listen to your testimony of what God has done in your life or I see it, all right, if I know that God has healed you from something or delivered you from something and I see it, I see something you used to be or used to do. And all of a sudden you different because you're not there anymore. And I've known you most of your life. 
or I've seen the transition in you and you've changed and you can tell me I can't explain it, but I don't want what I used to want. I don't like what I used to like. I crave worship and I can see it and I can identify with it because I've been there. I'm there now too. Then we encourage one another. That's iron sharpening iron. So we grow together. Mm. We grow together in our relationship with the Lord. Are you with me? Amen. All right? So that's a way of growing together in Christ. All right? So if we spend time in the word and we spend time encouraging one another in the faith, that's a way of growing. And because of that, and if I see something that has happened in your life, that encourages my faith to want to tap into some things that Jesus has done. And sometimes we don't tap into it because we, there's a lack of belief. I read what Jesus has done, but for some reason, because I'm stuck in the physical, I'm stuck in the tangible, I just can't wrap my brain around it to accept it. Our brain sometimes gets in the way of faith. And there's a reason for it, because the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith isn't based on what you can see. Faith is based on the reality of God, even though it's not seeable with the natural eye. It's because God can do it, even though you don't see it. It doesn't make sense that Jesus can take a little boy's lunch with five loaves of bread and two fish and feed 5,000 people. That makes no sense. It makes no sense that Jesus can take a, a clay pots of water and pour it into pitchers and take it out and have the guests serve it to the head of a feast and turn that water that came out of clay pots that were not supposed to be used for anything but washing hands and turn it into the best wine at a wedding. That doesn't make sense. But he did it. It doesn't make sense that he can raise somebody from the dead who'd been dead three days mm -hmm. in the grave, stinking, wrapped up in grave clothes, and call him by name as he did Jairus' daughter. Yes. And say, loose him and let him go. And he come back to life. But he did. The word says he did, and he did it. It makes no sense, but he did. Now, there are three types of healings. And we find it easy in some cases, and I'm going to qualify that, in some cases to accept one. One. And we've seen evidence of one. We've seen evidence that God heals from cancer. We've got evidence from it right here. We've got evidence that God heals from heart attacks. We've got evidence of it. We've seen it. We've prayed for both of those right here. We have prayed individually and collectively, have we not? Amen. Right here. Amen. We brought folks up to the front and prayed for them right here. Have we not? Amen. We've seen physical healings right here. They may not have been dramatic like some of the stuff 
we've seen on television that sometimes they make fun of. And yes, some of that stuff I, I get a little skeptical of because there have been people that have made sensationalism, turned it into sensationalism, mm -hmm. and made, uh, made a commercial, commercial uh, commercialized it, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And God doesn't want that. In fact, there, there's evidence in the scripture where God hates somebody doing that. There, there's a scripture that talks about somebody wanting to buy the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And the apostle told him, says, you and your money perish. Because it was not for sale. And I get a little leery when I hear folks say, send me X amount of dollars and I'll send you a prayer cloth and you can tap that on your head, pin it to your clothes and Please. The scripture tells me if any among you be sick, let them call for the elders of the church, anointing them with oil and the prayer of faith, faith shall heal the sick. Period. End of sentence. Now, you can read the rest of the scripture. I'm just emphasizing that one part right there. It didn't say anything about sending X amount of dollars to whoever, whoever. It says this is the way it is done. That's what the scripture says. But a lot of times we don't tap into it. We, we, that's the physical healing. But then there's a lot of times people still suffer. That was the first one, the physical healing. We find that the easiest one to accept. But there's a key to something else. You remember the man that was laying by the pool of a place called Bethesda? And he laid there all of them years waiting for the water to be troubled. Mm -hmm. Jesus asked him one question. He didn't ask him, do you want to walk? He didn't ask him, do you, do, do you want to be unparalyzed? The question he asked him was, do you want to be made Whole. Whole. That means, do you want every part of your being fixed? Made well? Amen. Everything that's wrong, out of balance, out of sync. Everything that's troubling you, inside and outside. Not just what we can see, but the stuff we don't see. Do you want to be made whole? They ain't made a sound this morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on with you, brother. And so then Jesus told him, take up your bed and walk. That's all he told him. Take up your bed and walk. Now, here's the part on the man that took faith. There was an action on that man's part. He had to get up. He had to get up. And then he had to roll up his bed. And on a day that it was illegal in Jewish law for him to even carry his bed. And Jesus told him, do it anyhow. He wanted some folks to see him as evidence to other folks. 
Remember, I told you, and David says it another way, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God's going to bless you in the place where the devil can see you get blessed. He's going to bless you not only in a place where the devil can see you get blessed. He's going to bless you in a place where the unsaved can see that God is at work. He's going to bless you in a place where the doubting can see that there's no reason to get to doubt. He's going to bless you in a place where those whose faith is weaker than yours are going to see that God is at work. And there is no doubt that God is at work. When we prayed for folks to get healed of cancer and they brought back the report, the doctor said, the doctor said, the cancer is gone. The doctor said, my heart attack is over with and I am okay. I will live and not die. Who gave the evidence? The doctor gave it and verified what God has done. And Jesus, when he healed the lepers, he said, go show yourself to the priests who were the ones to confirm what Jesus, what, what Jesus had done. So they went and they showed themselves that the leprosy was gone because that was part of what was was done. And then let me touch on that for a minute. You see, when Jesus, Jesus healed the leper, he did something that Jesus was not supposed to do. See, when you had leprosy, now let's say he had, let's say Jeffrey had leprosy. The law says if he has leprosy, I'm too close. He's supposed to have a bell or something and go through town hollering, unclean, 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 unclean. I'm too close. But Jesus went over and said, what's wrong with you? Jesus goes over and does something else because leprosy was considered highly contagious. He goes over and he touches him. So now, by all standards, you unclean, now I'm unclean too. But it says immediately, he's clean. And then he tells him, go show yourself to the priest. But two things happen. By doing so, he showed the leper that he was worth the touch of God. How many times have church folk looked down their noses on folks? I'm going to pray for you. But won't even reach out and go touch. Let me pray with you now. I don't care what you got. I'm going to pray for you now. I'm going to cry with you now. I'm going to rejoice with you later. We'll shout together later. But right now, I'm going to pray for you. Which leads me into the second healing because that leper got something else. He got some emotional healing. Because psychologically, spiritually, Emotionally, he wasn't able to even interact with other people like the woman with the issue, issue of blood. Same thing. She got the physical healing, but she was also an outcast because she had the same issues. She couldn't be around anybody because she had issues. But when she touched secretly, just to him, trying to do it on the sly. And Jesus felt the healing virtue leave. He says, your faith has made you whole. She didn't just get a physical healing. She got everything healed. 
her spirit, her emotion, the psychological scars. You see, a lot of times we've got deep-seated emotional and psychological scars. We can accept physical healing, but those things that hurt us from our childhood into our adulthood, those things that sometimes left us bitter, those things that caused us to take on habits that we can't break because the scars go so deep. Jesus wants those too. We can turn over the physical stuff, but it's hard to turn over the emotional stuff that sometimes causes us to be bitter, sometimes causes us to lash out at other people because we're so bitter ourselves on the inside, on the inside. And then there's the other healing, the last one. And this is one that's hard because sometimes we pray for folks to get physically healed and the way God heals them, we can't accept. And we roll the casket down the aisle and we have a funeral. We know that the person, if they know Jesus, and we say all the right words to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. We know the person gave their life to the Lord. We know this. We know this. We know this. We witnessed their baptism. We heard them say, Lord, I'm a wretch undone. I'm a sinner in need of salvation. I ask you to come into my life. We heard them say those words and mean them. We saw their life change. And when they got sick and we prayed for their healing and God called them home and we say, God didn't heal them. How dare we? The ultimate healing was given the day they gave their life to the Lord and the fulfillment didn't come in that life. It came when they stood before Jesus. It's called the resurrectional healing. Because the scripture tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you know, in the natural, we can't see it. All we see is a carcass laid out. Yeah. That's all we can see on this side. But if we know Jesus, we ought to be able to see in the spirit that the deceased now is completely whole in a glorified body shouting around the throne with Jesus no more sickness no more sorrow no more suffering no more pain in a glorified body and if we know Jesus one day we are going to be there too because we are also recipients of resurrectional healing we just haven't gotten there yet Those are the three types of healing. The most perfect healing is when Jesus calls somebody home that knows him. Because it was their time to be with him in the resurrection power. And when the Lazarus' sister says, oh, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. He says, I, he'll live again. Oh, I know he'll live in the resurrection. <laughs> you, don't, you still don't get it. I am the resurrection. Now you're going to make me have to bring him back to this life to prove it to you. And he's going to have to die again in this life. 
Just so I can show you, I have the power over life and death. And so he prayed a long prayer, longer than he had to. He could have just stopped right there and said, Lazarus, come forth. And like I keep telling you, if he had said, come forth, then the rapture would have taken place right then. So he had to specifically call Lazarus by name. Otherwise, every cemetery, the sea, and the earth would have given up their dead. So he called Lazarus by name. And he said, honey, I am the resurrection. And he called him by name. And that's what made them decide to kill Jesus, definitely, right then. But you know, them religious leaders were so dumb. I'm going to just say it like I feel it. They were so dumb. They saw it. They were standing there and saw it. You saw him bring Lazarus from the dead. That don't make no sense. They saw him bring Lazarus from the dead. Now you're going to kill the one who brought somebody back from the dead. Don't you think if he brought Lazarus back from the dead, he himself could get up from the dead as he did after you crucified him? As he tried to tell you, you destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. He says, I'm going to show you better than I can tell you. And when they crucified him, I'm going to Calvary now, y'all. When they crucified him, I told you last week, when you go to Calvary, I'm done. They crucified him, and on the third day, what did he do? I can show you better than I can tell you. He got up from the grave. Resurrection power. All power in heaven and earth. In his hands, resurrection power. And because he got up and we are in him, we get up too. Amen. Is there one? Amen. Is there one? Jesus says, now is the day of salvation.